Hey everyone, welcome to the Music Business Summit on Music Instruction from the Recording Academy and Freight and Salvage. This session is designed to help music educators embrace the transition to online instruction. We are hopeful that instructors of all disciplines will discover some useful strategies and tools for online coaching and teaching. We have a great panel for you this evening. Our first panelist is Ariana Cap. Ariana is a performing bassist, educator, best-selling author, online music instructor, and she was named one of Bass Guitar Magazine's hottest players in the world. Our second panelist is DJ Lamont. Lamont is a DJ, educator, music philosopher, and founder of Finger Snaps Media Arts Creative Studio in the Mission District of San Francisco. He is celebrating 33 and a third years as a professional DJ. Finally, we have Jake Wood. Jake is the drummer for the Hamilton Orchestra, an instructor, author, and creator of the Oscillator Drum Jams app. We want to kick it off with a question to Ariana Cap. Uh, Ariana, what is your starting point for setting expectations in the online sphere? Once a student is registered with you, you have all their info, you're ready to go, what do you make clear to them about what they should expect about online classes and what you're expecting from them? So I know one of the big issues when students move to the online sphere, they're not quite sure what is possible online as opposed to what happens in in-person classes. So the biggest hurdle that you have online is that people don't really know what to expect, but there is a lot that you can do in the preparation for the lesson, like how people sign up for my lessons, for example. Uh, that's a very structured process. It looks extremely professional. They can click through. They can say what their expectations are, what, they are, what their goals are. You know, I ask uh, every, everybody who signs up for the first time, they get to ask, uh, answer a long questionnaire about their goals, about what they want to be able to do, who their heroes are, what they're good at, rate yourself in all those skills. And so they, they, they already realize I'm really interested in uh, what, you know, what, what they are looking for. Uh, then the other thing is you want to be very, very clear in terms of what happens if, I guess we'll talk about teaching policies later, but you want to explain also to them, how is it going to work? Am I going to get an email? I'm paying you all this money. How is this going to, you know, what's going to happen next? So I always explain to them, this is what happens first. You know, that's all on my website. You sign up here, then you get a link, then you click on that. Here's where you can test Zoom. You know, I sometimes use Zoom. I sometimes use Duzu, but I always let them send them a link to test. And I always give them my cell phones if something doesn't work with connection they're not panicking don't know where to go and that has all helped I mean I found there's there's a lot of anxiety for people when they're doing that for the first time how is it, how is it gonna work and what I have done uh, this may not be everybody's cup of tea but if you're just starting out uh, and I have do, done this for a very very long time and I've never ever had anybody uh, take me up on it but I offer a hundred percent free uh, I hope after the lesson I say in my marketing materials, if you sign up and the first, you have to click here for the very first lesson, do the questionnaire, all of that. Um, if you don't, if you didn't like the lesson, I'll refund you 100%. Uh, if for whatever reason you and I are not, not a good fit, you get 100% of the money back. And the only condition is you have to tell me right after the lesson, so not like three weeks later or whatever, so I know about my schedule. But um, I, I found that very, very powerful because it really eases their anxiety. It gives them an opportunity to test the gear. Does this really work? And they're not out of $100 or whatever you charge. And, uh, and in, in that sense, it's been very, very powerful. It also shows I'm really committed. I want to make sure I can also say might not be a good fit, you know. I've ne again, it's never happened, but just having that on the site, I believe, keeps people, uh, that, that, that little trepidation that you have to sign up, you know. And I, by the way, I also did that when I was teaching in person. I used to have a physical music school in Vallejo. And all my teachers were required to do that, and we had a lot of success with it. You might, your, your gut instinct might be, well, might I've just worked for an hour and, and, you know, nothing comes of it, but you'll have 20 other people who will sign up for that, if, should this ever happen, which it very rarely does. You know, you're a good teacher, you know what you have to offer, you're passionate about it, you, you put yourself out there. They just want to know, is it working, can I trust this person? So this has been very, very successful for me. So again, set up telling them what will happen like in a step-by-step -step manner and and maybe giving something in the forefield so they don't feel like they're paying into this 
black hole of the internet and maybe they'll never see you and who knows what's going to happen. So those things really help. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. And it really helps make everybody, get, gets everybody on the same page in terms of what exactly is happening. Um, Lamont, I remember when we talked a few weeks ago, you talked a little bit, I mean, you have a unique situation because you're teaching DJ skills and which requires, you know, equipment, like elaborate equipment in some cases. And um, we talked about equipment and personalized customization to each, to each student. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, again, every student is on different levels. Economically, they're on different levels and experience, they're on different levels. Many of my students are new to the whole world, specifically standing behind DJ consoles. So I, I behind a DJ consoles. So what I do is I counsel with them to see where they are, to see not necessarily their, their dedication or seriousness to it, because I just feel if they came to me, um, they're, they're already committed to, to embracing this, this new form of art form. But the idea is I really check in to see where my students are academically, because many, you know, in, you know the notion, and when we're talking about purists, and I get that a lot where I get random people come into my studio and tell me a real DJ only plays vinyl and a real DJ only does this and only does that. And that's the notion that's out there. And I, I try my best. I hope that my students get to me before they go to a retail outlet because a retail outlet's job is to sell. <laughs> and they will sell you top notch $10,000 equipment and you don't even know where the on button is. When they come to me, I will tell them to buy the most affordable piece of equipment that's available. That could be anywhere from two to $300. If they have a little bit more money to spare, I may tell them to invest in something in the middle of the road. But I, it's not about the technology. It's not about the technology because when I think about my own experience, when I learned how to DJ back in 1980, 1980 1979, 1980, obviously we didn't have any of the technologies that we had today. We had two turntables, and I had a mixer that I found in a, in a tag sale, and the other one was in the basement, and a mixer that I found wherever it was at that time. I think it was Radio Shack. So I, I didn't learn how to DJ on top-notch equipment, and I do, do not push that agenda onto my students because I'm not in the hardware business. I don't represent any hardware company, and I don't push hardware. I really push where my students are because it's really about them being able to hear the music, feel the music, be able to count the beat, the tempo, and you don't need a special piece of equipment for that. You know, I'm glad you brought up the point about meeting your students where they are economically and things like that, because that's we had a really robust uh, conversation last time about this, and I've seen it um, online with other music educators and different music education entities talking about how do we price this stuff when it's when it's different. Um, you know, I've seen arguments all kinds of ways. Well, you should definitely lower because you're not on person. Um, you're, you're not in person with the, with, the, with the student. And other people saying, no, it's, the, it's basically me providing my service with all my skills and my background. Um, you know, there's, I think there's, there are good arguments um, on both sides. And, and Jake, what's your take on that in terms of where you kind of land your pricing for online versus in person? Um. <clears throat> My philosophy on it from the beginning has been that it's the same price as an in-person lesson. Like there's literally no logic to it being cheaper because it's not in-person. I mean, with the exception of if you were going to their house prior to that, that would be the only thing that re is removed from your situation that would somehow, you know, make it uh, less taxing on, on the teacher. But uh, I, I view it as like, it's the same price because this is it's still my my skill set it's still my my pedagogy my history of teaching it's still my studio you know like i i can't just suddenly rip the drums up and put them somewhere else that doesn't cost me money you know like uh, I, I still have the same expenses actually my expenses have gone up because now i need wi-fi in the studio so i should be charging more but well <laughs> we're in a recession, so that's that's a little messed up. But um, yeah, I, I, you know, and, and I think it's important to to really value yourself out of your through your pricing. You know, like musicians are terrible at self worth and and getting paid what we're actually worth. I mean, 
you know, like the hundred dollar gig that's been around for like years. 50 years, something like that. Yeah. Like the hundred dollar gig hasn't gone up. It's just stayed here. Cause we all look at it as like, well, that's normal. That's probably what I'm worth. And you're like, no, no, you've all been tricked. We're all worth a lot. Well, most of us that have put our heart and soul into this, we're worth a lot more, but um, at least when the teaching world, uh, we're not dealing with um, certain uh, club owners and economics. So we, we can charge, I think something that's much more uh, consistent with what we're worth. So this is, this is an opportunity for us to continue to establish our worth in the community. And it, it, it would seem very uh, counterproductive to the music industry to start charging less because it's online. Like, I mean, streaming already did that <laughs> and it hasn't helped us out at all. So uh, with the exception of promoting and, but even then now, what, what are we promoting? We can't, can't sell concert tickets. So yeah. Anyways, I'm getting a little bit off topic here. My bad. No, it's good to get your perspective on all of this because it's like I said, it's kind of a, it's kind of a big issue as we do these as we do this uh, transition. And Ariana, I wanted to mention, I mean, both you and Jake are authors and your books, and I'm just wondering how how does that all fit to your overall teaching persona? Like, do you do you write in order to teach from those books, or do you write um, to reach another sort of audience, or how do you see that mode? As an, as an educator? Well, as an online educator, you have this wonderful opportunity to market yourself worldwide, and you also have this opportunity to be discovered. People love to discover somebody. They don't want anything in your face. When they go to Starbucks and they see that little sheet saying guitar lessons or something, they just it just kind of goes away. But if you're looking for, let's say, good information on a topic, and then there's this person who you know answers these questions just in the way that speaks to you, for example, then you are you know gonna be um, you know interested in who is that? Does she teach and and so forth? And I I self published my first book in 2015, and um, has been a huge success. Um, just I would never have thought that a book on music theory for the bass player, <laughs> which is both of them are very small niches, would would take off in such a fashion. Um, and I think the reason is because I, I teach, I want to take things on the fretboard. I have a little bit of a different angle. The reason why I wrote it was because I didn't see anything like it. So that it, it's, some, it's like one piece that raises your profile, you know, if you have a book, if you, it gives you believability and you're going to be out there. I'm on Amazon. I'm on pages for Goodreads, you know. So people find you. They just love this discovering. So pe somebody might search something on base and they find my book and then they get interested and they search for you. And then if if they find you because you have YouTubes out or you have, you know, a, a website or a blog even. And that was another thing that was very strong for me in the beginning. I had that book out and it, I, I decided I want to do one thing um, every month. I started monthly. Every month to help market it because I didn't want to overwhelm myself. That's, I think, the, the, the mistake a lot of people make in the beginning. They want to do everything at once. And, you know, so just one thing. I thought I'll do one thing. And I started blogging. And so I created a blog, and then it turned from monthly to weekly. And I had continually growing readership and continually people commenting and, and asking me questions and so forth. And I also another thing I also did was I, uh, I started answering questions on Quora, you know. And so I think your, your original question was about valuation, was it? It, um, or about how to um, remind me of your edition, original question. I didn't want to get off track here. Well, yeah, earlier we were talking about that, but that's fine if you want to talk about that as well in terms yeah. of evaluation. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's just this, this people discover you. And, and I have I just yesterday opened up my waiting list. I have a waiting list of over 115 people on there. And this huge interest of, of people studying with me online. I just think it's, it's you know, you, you create something where people. <clears throat> find you and then it turns into market value you know if you have a lot of people who want this and you know we want to make it doable for people maybe have scholarships come up with all sorts of ideas i also have groups i have add-ons you know i have cohorts i have coaches who help students through some of my courses that's the next thing that i then build up on from the book you know i had the book and then there was so much response to it and people said we want more we want more like that and then i started creating an online course which is another good vehicle but again when you're just starting out i would recommend to one thing regularly and Quora is a great place. I don't know if you know that platform, but Quora, Q U 
O-R-A.com. People ask questions. And whatever your expertise is, you know, be it banjo playing or body percussion or, you know, bass playing or whatever, DJing, you know, you can, you can establish yourself as an expert in the field and then people find you. And if you have something that they can then use to connect with you, oh, she takes lessons, you know, I'm in Australia and I can, I can do that, you know. So that's a very powerful um, it's a powerful way to to uh, be found, and people really like that. And and then you see how much you can you know reasonably charge without, you know, being staying within reasonable limits. But you know, if somebody is is not gonna pay it, you 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 have others you can offer it to, or courses you can offer. So if somebody doesn't have money for private lessons, you can say, well, you can. I have some of these programs I teach as a course, and you can follow along there. It's much more affordable. So those are some of the things that I did. I think I think that you make a great point about establishing yourself as kind of a thought leader in your field in mm -hmm. some ways. And core is one way and and definitely blogging and blogging right are ways to get yourself out there so that you're seen in multiple on multiple platforms as an authority in your particular field. Yeah. And that then that kind of helps drive students or interest in you in you mm -hmm. and then interest in your teaching practice as well. And uh, you're all, um, you know, performers as well, and you do mu make music. And so I want to, before we move on to the next segment, I want to just touch on or get your thoughts about um, the balance between, you know, um, the purely creative work that you do and then the, because to be a, you know, to be a good instructor and to do the things that you guys have been talking about, you know, to schedule your stuff and to have a curriculum and to write books. Those are, um, those are skills that um, need to be developed and over time and sometimes are ostensibly at odds with the creative impulse, right? So what, how do you personally balance out those, those activities where you're, you're, you're an instructor on, on the one hand, but you're also, um, you know, in Ariana's case, a touring and performing bassist, in Jake's case, a very busy drummer, and Lamont, you're a DJ who not only teaches DJ, but you DJ yourself. Um, how do you kind of uh, do you, how do you, I don't want to say compartmentalize, but how do you make that balance between those two kind of aspects of your artistic self? I'd say anyone can jump in here. Sure. Well, mine started with, it was a soul searching mission, mission that I was on because the idea is that events are at night. What do I do during the day? And also just the overall fulfillment of life, finding something more meaningful, because no matter how exciting or great a gig was, it was over. It, no matter how big the stage was, the light still came down and the curtain closed and I was an hour lady sitting on my couch saying, now what? And that was really playing with my head a lot. Just the idea of the, the ebb and flow of life and the ebb and flow of gigs. And sometimes, you know, the, the phone wouldn't ring for six months for gigs. Mm -hmm. And that, that also was like, okay, what do I do with this spare, all this time that I have? So with, with, the prom, with the combination of, of just soul searching, looking for something more meaningful in life, something that belonged to me, something that was an expression of myself, is how I dove into the whole educational side. Because I had all of this knowledge, I had all this equipment that was sitting dormant when I was not DJing. And well, the idea is that I'm, by day, I'm an instructor. By night, I'm a teacher. I mean, by, I'm a DJ. <laughs> I, I marvel at the fact, sometimes I'm working with children, I'm in a school, you know, working at an after school program with 10 year olds. And then 12 hours later, I'm in some grungy club and people are getting down. <laughs> and, I, and I just look at that contrast, it's like, wow, I was with the innocence of 10 year olds and now I'm with adults and it's totally opposite of what I was experiencing in school. And um, so it is, it, it is being able to separate and separate and have the energy and to go home after a gig and say, let me get up so, and be fresh and, and on so I can be the best for my students. So it is, is it, it did help me discipline to balance the two. And as far as the other creatives that support the overall teaching, which is like I said, uh, marketing material, um, educational material, that was just an idea of do I watch a movie or do I start writing a paragraph? about my philosophies. And I'm at that point right now where I want to finish up my DJ manual 
And I'm like, well, do I want to watch a movie or do I want to write? And I'm like, I want to watch a movie right now. I'm not ready to go that deep into my head. So I'm not always on, not always ready to produce because I just want to give myself a break. And because it's day and night, I do have to take myself out of what I'm doing because if not, I would just be spinning in music 24 seven. And that's not the life I want either. I want to make sure I have a balanced life with family and friends and relaxation. So it's, it's all the above, but it's, it's, it's just another manifestation. It's another reflection of my personality, the philosophical educational side. And then I separate the DJ Lamont side from the, the instructor. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jake, did you have a thought about that before we move on? Yeah, um, it's actually <clears throat> kind of a little bit more of the opposite of, of how I sort of view the creative versus the teaching side. Um, although I certainly know that that situation of the innocence of teaching with the scandalous nature of playing shows and what I've done on stage or what I've seen on stage. And then the next day I'm, you know, working with the cutest of six-year-olds who's just happy to <laughs> hit a drum. You're like, oh God, okay, all right. Um, <clears throat> but in terms of, of trying to, you know, manage the concepts of, of being a teacher versus being a performer and, or, or being a creator of, um, uh, you know, content for learning. Uh, I've, uh, to me, I, I view stuff like, like writing a book or, or in my case, creating an app, not the programming side, but the develop the conceptual and, and musical side of it. Um, I view those as, as equally creative, um, endeavors and they're they're to me they're actually just as fulfilling as working on something actually musical be it like a new musical idea or you know um i was actually just talking to my, my buddy john mater uh, another drummer from hamilton who today he was telling me he was doing a bunch of contracting work in his abundant spare time and he's like man this is so fulfilling and i'm like i know that feeling like it's to me it it, it it's a different part of your soul but there's a big gray area that just, you know, it, 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 I think it all, all gets um, satiated in, in some form or other. And, and, and one of the other side of that is that I feel like these projects, like, a, like writing a book um, or making an album um, or writing a manual, like to me, those are, they come in like mini seasons where like you, you know, maybe for a couple of weeks, you're just on this kick where like you're in it and you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm writing this book right now because that's where my head is. And then, and then, you know, then all of a sudden Netflix comes out with the old Monty Python flying circus. And next thing you're just like, okay, I needed a week of that. And then, you know, whatever. Um, and one other um, uh, point of where, where things really actually meet together, you know, like I'm, I'm still practicing daily. I don't know what I'm practicing for, but I'm just really enjoying it. <laughs> and, uh, and I, and I'm obviously still teaching and, you know, I've been working a lot on like quintuplets and just being in this world where like, it's the only thing I work on because I want to treat them a certain way. And, uh, I'm having so much fun with them that with my advanced students, uh, you know, like just kind of on the fly, I was like, Hey, do you guys want to learn quintuplets today? Cause I've been working on this really fun stuff that I've just been making and they're totally down for it. So suddenly you just have this merging of the creative stuff you've been working on teaching it to others and, and, you know, seeing how that works with them. And yeah. So, uh, you know, to, to, to divide the line, like, like it's black and white. I mean, it certainly can be at times like, as like Lamont was saying. Um, but I think it, there's also a very healthy mixture of the two. So. Right, and you allow the the teaching and the instruction to become a, a creative act itself. Oh you yeah, think, you improvise yeah, yeah. a I lesson mean, like you were talking about. You're working on something as a drummer, and you think, "Oh, I can actually do that with one of my students." And yeah, and a, yeah, and that's that's not to say that like my lessons are all improvised. You know, like I I I put a book together because I I'm I really want certain things learned for everybody that I think are very important. Um, but great book, by the way, I've used it. Thank you, man. That's, <laughs> that means a lot to me. I, I appreciate hearing that. Um, but, but also I, I think that, uh, having a, an element of spontaneity or just some amount of improvisation with, within lessons can, can 
keep things fresh and exciting and um, for, for both parties. It's true. And I appreciate all of, the, um, all of your thoughts on that one before we move on to the next section, which is all about marketing. And uh, when we met a few weeks back, we had a uh, really good conversation about different things that teachers can do. Because this, this, it always comes down to this. this, this um, I get a lot of questions about, this, about the best ways to get your name out there. And I thought Ariana had a really great point about establishing yourself somehow as a, as a thought leader in your field through various other platforms. But then the, you come down to the nuts and bolts of your class itself. Um, you know, whether you're going through an entity like the Freight and Salvage, we have a pretty large staff of teachers who teach through us and who also teach privately. And then there's, you know, many, many musicians and music makers of all kinds who um, probably attending this event who completely do it by themselves and are sometimes stuck, especially if you're just starting out, you're wondering, how do I even, how do I even get people to know that I'm someone who's good at what I do and I, and I can help you in your journey with music? Um, and Ariana, I remember you had some really helpful um, tips about a marketing practice and can you talk a little bit about that sure happy to so especially when the pandemic hit a lot of people hit me up and said can you please help me get online so i really started thinking about that in a quite formalized way so one thing i i noticed is like if you're a musician you probably have a bunch of youtubes out you probably are on some facebook groups you might you know maybe hanging out on some forums that you like or maybe on quora and what you can do and that's a really low hanging fruit you just take an afternoon take a couple of hours and just go through all of your youtube library and put a link to your teaching um, like, you know, the way I'm set up, it's one click and it goes right to payment and scheduling and all of that and the policies and all of that. But if you don't have that, then at least put, you know, your emails somehow disguised so the bots don't find you. But there are ways to do that, like with the at, you know, if you make parentheses and put the at in there. Um, but you have, if you have something out, you know, and especially also want to encourage you to think about your speciality. You know, what is your niche? What is the thing that people might find you for? And um, one thing that you can do is look for like Facebook groups who are particularly talking about, you know, whatever it is, um, a certain style of music, a certain instrument, a certain age group uh, that you feel like you can really serve well. And then you go there and you just answer questions. And everywhere you answer a question, just make sure your little link is there or in your, you know, in your profile. So when people click is you can take lessons with me here or click here for lessons or for more info or something like that. That is really low hanging fruit. So think about everything you have already out there. Um, YouTube gives an opportunity to add a little slide at the end of your video you have to be an advertising partner with YouTube and jump through some hoops. So if that comes, if the tech ever gets in the way, just do plan B, go simple, you know, but just start somewhere. And by just one thing that I recommend to my uh, teaching coaching clients is, is just like go on a forum once a day, answer a question, put your link, you know, and then that way, again, you, you, you get discovered. You're not like waving in somebody's face, you know, take lessons with me, but people find you and they like what you have to say and how you present yourself. And that is, that is really helpful. Um, then another thing that has worked really well for me is partnerships. So maybe you have endorsements, maybe you, you know, know an editor of a magazine or somebody who works for one. And one, for example, I reached out to notrebel.com, which is an online based magazine I just called them up and I said look I just published a book I was just thinking do you guys want some educational content and they say oh yeah definitely and and so I started sending them uh, videos uh, about you know we call it talking technique and that just you know, they have a YouTube channel with hundreds of thousands of, I think the subscribers are hundreds of thousands, but their YouTube channel is pretty large as well. So they, it gets posted on their, on their magazine and it, it just gets ends up in a lot of eye in front of a lot of eyeballs and so maybe you have some of those connections and you know offering something for free at first can really serve you well on the back end you can 
try some things. If it doesn't work out, you just lost a couple of hours. But, um, you know, it may just be that you really start getting traction and that your column really takes off and people start emailing you about it and finding you because of it and so forth. That has definitely happened for me. So ex exploring partnerships is, is a really good one. And also, again, whatever you already have out there, just add your little call to action. You know, marketing people call that the CTA, the call to action. What am I supposed to do? Well, I just watched this video and I really liked it. Well, now would be a good time to say, by the way, you can take lessons with me. So um, hopefully those are some tips that are helpful. That's really important, especially the call to action, because like uh, Jake was talking about, musicians don't always think of that because they want to create the work and they want to be in the, in the moment with the music. And maybe, you know, they might go and they make a video, like they make a nice looking video, they're playing is great on it. And they might be feeling bashful about like, now come and sign up with me. But that's, that's the key part, right? That's the part where you, you want to make sure that they can take an action after they've seen you, you in action, whether it's you're answering something on Quora, or whether they've just seen a little clip of you, you know, doing something really incredible on the instrument. Um, so that's, that's really great. Um, next up, we want to talk a little bit about just the, the basic, like the automation and tools that are involved in um, getting your students to you. So we have, um, we had a conversation about that and here we have a screen about it. Um, Jake, you want to talk a little bit about this part? Um, I, is this not an Ariana question? I'm, I'm a little, uh, I, or, or okay, can you, yeah. We, yeah. We can go with Ariana on that. Um, the automation and tools part, um, the sign up experience, we talked a little bit about it earlier, Ariana, the, um, tell us a little bit about the sign up experience in your class. Or for sure. your I mean, one thing I love about online teaching is you can automate almost everything. And one thing that I automate is my scheduling. And part of that scheduling software, the one that I use is called Acuity Scheduling, but there's also others like Calendly, for example. Uh, but I love Acuity Scheduling because it allows me to uh, create bundles. It allows me to, while people are signing up, go into a Google Doc that is full of questions and engaging content and also things that help me prepare for the first lesson. And uh, it's a really nice click through step by step. This is going to happen next. This is where you pay. They also, and this is really a big one, they take uh, care of the payments so you don't um, end up uh, you know, having to keep track. Well, they bought a bundle of four, so how many did they already take? Well, they moved that lesson. Did they move it within the allotted time frame? You know, and there's there's some great things you can do on Acuity. You can you can tell it. Once well, there's a funny button, you can tell it to look busy, make me look busy. Like you can tell it to like let me look, let let make it look like I'm 60 percent. Because you know, when you're just starting out, you might be like a little worried about having Monday through Friday gaping open. You know, so um, it has little little tricks you can use like that in the beginning, or you know, these packages or um, you know keeping track of payment when people cancel or move a lesson they can do that on the back end you just see it disappear out of your schedule and then it moves over and if you want to have a teaching policy let's say within 24 hours you're allowed to ch change but not less than that you can set all of that it's very intuitive um, then you know they they have to pay payment kicks in but you don't have to keep track of any of that and that automation is just a godsend you know because you'll be ending if you don't have that you'll be ending up a lot on email uh, you'll be and, um, yeah and and then be what, stuck on lots of lots of admin work while you're trying to do that yeah and, and another thing that's an important um, question that I get a lot, and hopefully that Berkeley panel will really dive deeply into that, is what tools to use, you know. And my advice, especially if you're just starting out, if you're in a situation you just need to get online now, you know, because of all that's happening, um, just go simple. You know, when I first started, I was just cobbling it together between Skype and FaceTime and, you know, all of it. You, you, you just, just start, you know. You will learn so much in the process. I mean, people go by the perfect microphone and the perfect mixer and all of that is important it's great when you start diving deeper but to just start out use use anything that works i think Let's jump in mm -hmm. um, we're running out of time let's just go to the next slide which is about uh, teaching policies and uh you know that's it's funny it sounds funny to talk about but it's true like you have to because you're running a small business you basically you're running a business and you need to have some kind of you know you need to have boundaries, you need to have some kind of, you know, requirements, rules, whatever word you want to use, uh, and you need to be clear about them. Um, I like to say the, the online space does not allow for a handshake, that's true. Um, 
Lamont, can you talk a little bit about what you, you know, what kind of expectation, we talked about the expectations, but what kind of policies you put in place immediately just so there's no confusion and there's no, you know, weird feelings if something doesn't work out? Absolutely. My, my policies are very simplistic. And they're simplistic from the point of view, if I have a 24 hour cancellation policy and I have a no refund policy and that's basically it. And out of the 15 years that I've been teaching, I would say 99% of my students have honored that. There's been a few that have just dropped off and I've never heard from them again. And I personally and professionally don't wanna turn what I do or have a document that's so legally buffed up, written by a lawyer that I can't even understand it. And that was very important to me because if I can't understand it, there's no way that I can probably try to translate it to them to enforce what I need. And in turn, I have to hire someone, which is a lawyer, to do that. And again, that, that's more on a good faith aspect of the approach that I take. And it has honored itself. It has honored itself because I just want it to be simple. I want it to be clear from my point of view. And because students have invested their money because they have paid for classes up front, if they cancel, they, they lose out on their money. And I have had students who just disappeared and I haven't heard from them. They took one class and they played for 10 classes and I haven't heard from them in two or three years. During the pandemic, I had a few students contact me within the first month when we realized that this was gonna pl play out much longer than anticipated. And they asked for a refund and I instantly gave it to them because this is an unusual circumstance. And, and I, I realized, you know, everything was shut down. So I did not want to get, again, get into a legal battle about this circumstance because that takes just as much energy and time and more expense to try to recoup that. And I just graciously gave them back their money because again, that was so unusual. Yeah. Had, and that way you keep it, uh, you keep it at a human scale too. When you yeah. Do that. Yeah, that's just, again, that's just my approach because I, I, I just like contracts as it is. I, anytime that anyone gives me like all these disclaimers, you all, I don't know what all that stuff is. That was written by lawyers. <laughs> hmm. For me to take the time to try to comprehend that can take hours and I still don't understand what I meant. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I just find it's like, it's a, it's a, it's a non-qualitative system because you're issuing this document that was written by a team of lawyers and you're, you're pretending to know what it is and to put this forward on someone that you don't even know what it is. So I've always taken that simplistic approach about it because I just want to- Makes be a lot of sense to keep it simple and it keeps it very human in that way. Um, before we jump into the Q&A, we have just a few minutes for any just final thoughts from the panelists. Jake, do you have any parting words for any of the instructors out there who you know, might be wondering about trying it out for the first time or to get deeper into it? The water's real nice. Um, not, you know, I, I, I view it as like, you're, it's, it's kind of a sink or swim situation. And at this point, depending on what happens in November, uh, there's a good chance that this is going to, uh, that the quarantine will last a long time. And, and you know, even if you feel like, oh, you're late, it's too late. I missed the boat. You're like, no, it's never too late. You can still jump in. Um, every, you know, one, one of the things that I, I learned from um, my, uh, my bandmate, the fiddle player, Jason Kleinberg, who has a great YouTube uh, fiddle lesson page. Sorry, I was terribly worded. Uh, but he, you know, he just said to me, he's like, you know, you put your stuff online and like the people that, that, um, that, you know, even though there's so many other people that do the same thing that you do, you're different. You know, every, everybody is unique and you, you, you offer what it is that you do and some people are, will gravitate towards that. And it's like, yeah, so just, just put it online, just give it a shot. That's, that's how I view it. You know, and I, I was, I did not want to do this. I, I went kicking and screaming, but, um, but I, I have embraced it. And to this day, uh, the, the days that I teach are, you know, getting to see my students um, is the best part of my week. And I mean, that, that's never really changed, but I value it so much more now, so. Excellent, thank you, Jake. Ariana, any final thoughts in a minute or so? Yeah, totally. I also wanna add similarly to Jake, words of, uh, you know, encouragement to just try it and to just start somewhere and to not fret the tech too much, to not 
you know, let anything get into the way of, uh, you know, of, of, of getting started. And maybe then again, to consider doing one small thing that you can do regularly, just to signal to your own self, you're serious about this, you know, you want to, you want to pursue that. And, and I agree that the internet is huge. It's like a big, wild, open field, you know, also maybe want to say, make sure you protect yourself, you know, protect yourself in terms of, you know, don't take when well, maybe this one one good piece of advice don't let them pay you via paypal family and friends um i have never done that and there were have has been one instance where i was really glad i didn't because i i could use paypal's very, very uh, organized and easy to use tools to protect yourself as a merchant. And, you know, you pay them a little bit of a fee, but it's absolutely worth it because if somebody comes at you, you don't have to handshake, you know, you don't look somebody in the eye and you know it's going to be okay. You don't have that online. There is always the screen in between. And because of that, you want to protect yourself. You know, you want to have teaching policies that say exactly what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. And I agree they can be and should be very simple, understandable, completely agree with Lamont on that. Um, but you just want to say what happens if the internet goes out, what happens if somebody gets a time zone wrong, you know, you just want to spell it out. I always do. If it's my fault, I eat it. If it's your fault, I can't. And, you know, and then you have something to point to and any kind of conflict that might end badly because the internet is such a weird place where you say something with 140 characters that you otherwise would never say to a person, you know, then you are protected. But those are minor things. And, and again, the water is warm and it's wonderful. And think about your specific thing that you do really well and just give it a shot. I certainly wish you luck. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Ariana. We'll jump into the Q&A, but Lamont, do you have uh, something, uh, any last thoughts in a minute or so? Yeah, just uh, multiple things, but this is something I'm tolerating. I don't like it. I don't. <laughs> I don't. And and I don't like it. It's it's something. It's like eating spinach. You're doing it because you know it's going to make your body stronger. But other than that, I'd rather have a basket of French fries. And um, and and I'm I'm tolerating it. And I, I've had some highs and some meaningful moments with my students. So it's not drudgery. But I I don't like the format. Um, I'm a piece of people person, I'm a one-on-one -on -one person, and I'm just tolerating this time that we're in. Like you said, I'm going down this river of uncertainty until we get to a dock of safety. <laughs> so if, if, if you need to just get through this to get through it and you're not thrilled by it, it's okay. You don't have to like this format because we are a social people. We, we're supposed to be in the same room with each other. And we're using these apparatuses as a tool to facilitate what we're doing right now. And as far as marketing is concerned, I've done every type of marketing from billboards, TV commercials, radio advertisements, and whatever you can afford, if just printing a flyer and putting it outside your front door or telling a friend, um, all of that, it can just facilitate to getting clients. Cause I've gotten clients from all aspects of life and and I paid top dollar for clients for advertising and never got a call. I put a little sign outside my window and people are knocking on the door. And so that's the fun. I, I like the marketing part of what I do more than anything because it's just, it's so creative. And there's no one, I talk to marketing experts all the time and no one can ever give me a definitive about how to really do all this. They just throw some concepts out there and you, you throw the balls up in the air and you catch which one you think works for you. And, uh, and one more quick thing, if you're brand new to this, just start writing down your points, writing down what you want to convey as an instructor. And that's how I started. I just started writing a, a sentence at a time. And the next one I know, I mean, after hours and hours, I had a curriculum. So if this is brand new to you. Just start writing your thoughts. What is it philosophically that you want to present through your lessons? What is it structurally that you want to present through your lessons? And all that just helps. And next thing you know, you will have a curriculum. So have fun with it. Don't put pressure on yourself. Don't give yourself a time limit of when it should be done. Just work on it. And next thing you know, you will have a book, a, a pamphlet, a manual, a curriculum, a how-to, and then you can just launch from there. Yeah, you know, Lamont, I really appreciate your honesty on that. You know, I don't like it, is what you said. <laughs> I know. After yeah. every class, I turned to my husband. And I said, I don't like this. So yeah. I just don't don't so I just don't get caught up in the illusion that you have to enjoy this because that's yeah. ridiculous. You don't. Well, I think. Uh, why, 
but you don't, if you don't, if you're walking away feeling empty, which I have like, okay, that was cool. But be honest with it. I mean, you don't have to love this format. You, you yeah. don't. So uh, the reason why I appreciate it is that I think, you know, in a, in a strange way, it could be inspiring to the people that are kind of on the fence right now. They go, well, he's done it. Does isn't crazy about it, but it's working, you know? And I think it's part of surviving, right? It's part of surviving as an artist in these times is to take a look at your options and go, okay, what are my options here to continue the work that I profess to love and have committed my life to, right? Um, so it's, it's good to hear that, I think, that viewpoint as well. Um, we do have a couple of questions that made it through here. Um, the first one is from uh, Peter. It's any thoughts on using Jacktrip? Now, Jacktrip is a piece of software for working, for playing music live together. Um, at the Freight, we have a lot of jam classes where people get together um, and play music together and just jam on different acoustic instruments. And we haven't been able to continue that because Zoom isn't the greatest place for getting like 15 people together to play instruments and have it all be together. Um, but Jack Trip is something that's, that um, has been suggested a couple of times now. I haven't personally experienced it yet. Um, I know it's being worked on by some people at Stanford um, and some people are saying really good things about it. Is, have any of you tried that in terms of playing with other musicians on Jack Trip or any other uh, kind of renegade software that's out there right now? Ariana? Yeah, so what, what I've been using, and this is purely a teaching tool because I have not been able to find anything. And as far as my research has shown, because of latency issues and because of everybody's internet being different, is really, really hard to make this a reality. So you, you are really in time together and can feel the groove, you know. Um, but I have found a platform that's really good for teaching. They're called Duzu. It's double O, double Z, double O. They're out of Germany. And... Um, what what I like about them is, you know, in Zoom, let's say I want to bring in a backing track, like a jam track, because I can't play the piano while they're playing bass. So I want to give them something to jam to. So in Duzu, I have all my files right there and I can just click them through and fly them into the lesson. So nobody has to lose the, the window. In Zoom, when I email it, they have to go to their email and they don't find me. And you're, you know, you're having these little Ugh! moments, you know, so it's a really powerful a position to be in when you when I'm the one who's controlling the click they have a little metronome in there they have a tuner in there you know I can slow down and speed up and change the key of, of any backing tracks that I fly in there and then I can set it so it's either syncing my playing that backing track or the metronome or whatever I'm using or I can set it so it's syncing to their playing and that is at least allowing me to be in control nobody has to leave the zoom room so to speak and we are we are still on the same page and I feel like I'm conducting this I'm not sending them somewhere and hoping they find me again and this sort of thing so that's been helpful um, uh, but in terms of jamming together, man, whoever figures that one out is going to be well off. <laughs> going to do really, really well. Yeah. <laughs> and there are also, um, there, obviously, there's a bunch of issues around Zoom and audio and technical aspects of doing this. Um, and people have questions about that. But I think we will invite the guests to address those things in the Facebook group, which I think the thread has been shared, or via the uh, Grammy processions that's going to happen next week in, in conjunction with the Berkeley School of Music. So we have one other um, question here that came through from Michael. It says, in addition to teaching actual playing, singing, and composing, I've been road testing a series of well-researched listening workshops. Most workshops are two and a half hours. What price would you recommend for a two and a half hour listening workshop? Uh, I'm not sure if he means um, a workshop where you are taught how to like intentionally listen, or if you are um, you know, being exposed to a certain type of music, but what what do you think is a good price for that where you're not maybe hands-on with an instrument, but you're um, experiencing music with a guide for two and a half hours? I, I did host something like that live. It was, the series was called Talk What We Hear, and I launched it last July, and it was an in-person talk series, and I would choose 10 records about a specific genre or decade or sound and go through the chronology of that specific sound. And that was an in-person and that was a, a, uh, a pilot. And I charged $15 for that. And basically folks will come to the studio and I've had as little as one part, uh, participant, the most I ever had was about 12. And again, from ver various marketing. So that marketing, and so that was in, in person. Um, 
I would, I would think $25 at, at a minimum because I wanted to increase my prices, but again, COVID changed everything. At least the $25 minimum for a, um, a talk series or a listening session. Any other thoughts on that, Ariana or Jake? Uh, remind me of the question. I'm sorry, I wasn't in the chat. This is someone who, uh, in addition oh, to Michael, teaching and playing. Yes. Sorry, sorry. I know Michael very well. Big shout out to him. Wonderful educator and teacher, super versatile. So Bay Area cat who I know, happy to know. Um, what I would say about pricing is this. What I always do is I run a beta group and I test it. And I see how many people sign up. I see how it all gels, how it works out. And uh, I might even ask people, you know, how much uh, would, you, would you be willing to pay? Um, you can't always do that. But what I've also done is to just, just try it, you know. Um, it's always good to start with like a bit of a higher number, but give a discount. Um, you can, you know, set this up with discount codes or any old, old way you want to. Um, you can, you can, um, it, it's a matter of testing. It's really a matter of what does the market want and agree to and what, also what is your purpose with doing that? I've done a lot of courses or of course fragments for free because I wanted to test. I wanted to see how it works, how people are reacting. And that can be a wonderful way to, to do it for a while. And that will give you ideas, you know, how many people are are interested, are coming in, are asking you questions, and, uh, and then you can take it from there. It's very, pricing is a very hard one. If you can find something comparable, you know, that that's good. Is there a way how you can archive it? Also a question that often comes up with course type or group type stuff is what if I miss a group? What is the, is it available long term? Like my courses have lifetime access, which when I first started, I just threw that out there. I'm going to give lifetime access. Well, now it turns out I have to ten, pay 10 cents per person and it might get super expensive. So you have to be very careful what you, what you promise because you have to keep it. But um, there, there are ways of, you know, repurposing the material. If you do a group, maybe you can record it and then later on put it in as part of a course, you know, if there's a life aspect to it. So there, there are lots of, of options how you can just try and see what does the market say. Pricing is, is a difficult, difficult one. Always a little tricky, right? Yeah. And, you know, with something you said reminded me of, Jake, we didn't really get a chance to talk too much about your app. Um, and, and I'd love to hear, like, how that started and, you know, what the, what the original idea was and, and where it landed and how it's been for you, because, you know, moving into that area as a drummer and educator. Sure. Um, <clears throat> it started with me. Uh, I mean, I, I wrote this book because I wanted to teach a very specific patterns to students and I felt like the um, archaic war horses that uh, I grew up learning from just there's too much too much crap that I had to censor essentially um, so I, I you know put my own stuff together and I love playing other instruments and I think it's really great to add bass or guitar or keyboards to a student's lesson and it seems like most students really like that a lot um, and when I play a bass with the drum beat, I am lining up those bass notes with their kick drum, or, you know, if I'm playing a guitar, it's lining up with their snare parts, whatever. Um, so after doing that for years, I just, I thought, well, like, well, wouldn't it be great if students could take this home and practice with that? So, uh, I happen to have the lug the, you know, one of the benefits of, of uh, being in San Francisco is that you're um, teaching a lot of uh, very tech savvy students. And one of them is this fantastic developer. And I approached him with the idea and he was like, yeah, let's make a, 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 a an app. And, and the app is basically um, just a library of loops that are written for specific drum beats. And you can alter the tempo of those loops and you can also alter the mix of them, which one of my favorite things to do is play, play a loop for a student and then be like, okay, kid, so um, what were the instruments you heard? And then we can actually, you know, pull down the bass and we can pull down the guitar and suddenly they're like, oh, there's a, there's a keyboard in there. I had no idea. You know, like, yeah, that's what makes music. Um, so it's, it's an odd, uh, you know, I did not plan this app with a quarantine and Zoom lessons in mind, but it has... <laughs> turned out to be very valuable because students still get to uh, use that and actually have a musical 
you know, uh, experience that involves other instruments aside from just a metronome. Although I know I'll, I'll mention this um, for anybody that's interested in, in teaching online that hasn't done it before. Man, one thing I, I did immediately was pretty much everything that a student plays needs to be with a metronome because the Zoom connection or the internet connections can be so faulty that it will make them sound like they are completely out of rhythm, like slowing down, speeding up. It's it like it's almost nauseating at times. Um, and when you put a metronome, when you make them put a metronome on, you start hearing the compression and, and rarefaction of, of time. And you're just like, wow, that's the worst metronome I've ever heard in my life. But at least, you know, they're playing with it. So there's you know, an insurance policy there. Cool. Thanks for that, Jake. I want to make sure we touched on the app. And I want to thank all three of you, Ariana, Lamont, and Jake, for your creative input into tonight's discussion and all the prep work you put into this and sharing your time and experiences with this group. And, and to everyone, to all the attendees, I hope we've tackled uh, some of the considerations for moving your practice along into the online sphere. And I want to thank the Recording Academy team for getting this all set up from LA to Seattle to San Francisco. And uh, we'll be keeping the conversation going online with the procession uh, coming next week. Um, again, my name is PC Munoz. I'm with the Freight and Salvage in Berkeley, California. And th thanks again to everyone for, for coming tonight. And I hope that, uh, hope that you came away with some good stuff tonight.